right, so for our mastermind today, we're going to be hearing from Betsy Montoya, our assistant director. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give a quick bio about Betsy, and then we'll welcome her up here. So Betsy Montoya grew up in a small town of Minersville, Utah, and graduated from Beaver High School and went on to attend BYU-Idaho. Before finishing school, she completed an 18-month LDS mission in Brazil. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in social studies education. After graduating, Betsy moved to Utah Valley and has been working with the Cal and the LEAD program since the summer of 2012. Please welcome Betsy Montoya. Thank you for allowing, thank you for showing up, first of all, because uh, I know it was emailed out that I would, that I would <laughs> that I would be here. Um, but I am grateful for this opportunity to actually speak um, with you. Most of you I've been able to teach um, or speak with in some capacity before, so hopefully this won't just sound like the same old, same old that you always hear from me. Um, but when Alan asked me to speak, um, I was given the topic of positivity. Uh, now, many of you, how many of you, when you took the Strengths Finder, out of those of you who did take the Strengths Finder, had positivity in your top five strengths? So maybe you should be up here giving this, <laughs> giving this lecture, um, because I didn't have positivity in my top five. I do feel like I'm a pretty optimistic, positive person, so it's probably somewhere in the top ten, but... Uh, I am grateful to be able to focus a little bit more on my own positivity and how I express that. Um, to begin with, I want to tell a little story. Now, this is a picture of a picture, so it's a little fuzzy, uh, but this is the Beaver High School fall, two th let's see, if, not 2000, I'm not that young, uh, <laughs> 1997 volley freshman volleyball team. And uh, that's me uh, sitting there at the bottom, not at the very bottom, kneeling down, number 23. <laughs> um, but I have always, my mom has always said that I have a little twinkle in my eye, like I'm up to something or a little mischievous. And I do like to be a tease. And growing up, my siblings kind of had to deal with that. They gave it in return. Um, now I have a husband to bother, and I like to tease him. Uh, sometimes my coworkers, I like to tease. They can attest to that. Jules, I love to tease Jules. Um, <laughs> Josh, he works in our office. Um, but as a freshman, we were going to a volleyball game at a different in a different town, not cities. I'm from a small town, so we didn't we didn't play against cities. We played about <laughs> played against towns. But we were going um, on the bus with the team. With the it was the varsity JV and freshmen. We all went together because that's just how it was. That's we all fit on the same bus. Um, and one of my fellow teammates was on the bus in front of me, leave, leaning over the seat. So her back was facing me. So duty required me to just do a little tug on her shorts um, because she was leaning over and exposing herself to that situation. Um, <laughs> so I just gave a little tug on her shorts, and they came, you know, they came down a little bit. And she turned around and said, "Betsy, what are you doing?" and put them back up, and that was that. Um, and it was on a bus full of girls. It wasn't that big of a deal, right? Well, we got to the game. We played our game. We played earlier because we were the freshmen. But then we were expected to stay, obviously, because the bus was our ride, so we had to stay anyway, um, and support the, uh, the varsity team as they played. And so we would, we would keep our uniforms on, and we would cheer with the cheerleaders. So I'm down in front by the, the cheerleaders are right here, you know, looking up into the crowd, and I'm sitting right in front of the cheerleaders, and I'm cheering with them, being the best little cheerleader I can, and, you know, saying bump, set, spike, or whatever we were doing. I don't, I don't know. And unbeknownst to me, uh, someone was sitting right behind me uh, exacting her revenge. And um, so just in the moment when I've got my hands in the air, cheering to my little heart's content, uh, I feel the same thing happened to me, and my, my shorts were tugged down. Um, now, I didn't ever know that I had quick reflexes, but in that moment, my shorts came up faster than they have ever come up in my life. Uh, <laughs> no dawdling. 
Uh, to this day, I don't know if you know I was exposed or anybody saw anything, but um, that experience happened as a freshman in front of a large crowd. Watch, it probably wasn't that large. It was volleyball, but um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'll, I'll come back to that experience in just a second. So um, moving on, for those of you who do have um, positivity, um, there are certain descriptors, and maybe you haven't taken the strengths finder, that's fine, but as you look at this, as we quickly go, go through this, these descriptors of positivity, I want you to see if you recognize any of these things in yourself, or as you look around this room, or maybe other people you know, friends, family members, if you recognize these things in them. So we're gonna go through some of these, and I want to point out a couple people that to me uh, embody some of these, these attributes or these descriptors. Um, so the first one is generous with praise. And when I think of this, I think of Jules. She's, I work with her, and she's always complimenting people and making them feel good. She's very generous. With, with her praise. Um, the next one is quick to smile. And when I think of this one, I think of Kelsey. There she is, Kelsey Backus. You actually had positivity in yours, right? Yeah, and I know that Kelsey is a, is a very positive person. When I think of quick to smile, I think of Kelsey. And if, she, if you've had her as a team leader or you've associated with her, then you know that about her. Um, on the lookout for the positive in the situation. Uh, that's, that's something that's essential in life to be able to, to be able to see that lighthearted people want to be around you when i saw this one i really thought of madison mansfield she just had a birthday recently and she's sitting right over there and maddie is the type of person that i know so many people love being friends with her and i think she also has positivity as one of her strengths is that correct um uh, contagious enthusiasm Finding a way to lighten others' spirit, bringing them up when they might be feeling down. Um, injecting drama into every project. Is George here? George is hanging out in the back. <laughs> George Banner. When I saw this, I thought of him. And George doesn't actually have positivity in his five, top five, but that's okay. It's, it's, it, like I said, think of people you know, whether it's yourself or someone else. And I thought of George, because he makes things exciting, and he, he adds that drama and that excitement to the to whatever you're doing, to the project, to the experience, whatever it is. Um, celebrating every achievement, finding ways to make everything more exciting and vital. Don't you love having those type of people around you that have the ability to do that? Um, those type of people are rarely dragged down, um, which, again, is essential in life because there are so many things around us that could drag us down. Just watching the evening news. Sometimes I want to cry, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's an essential you know, life skill that, that is good to develop. And then a conviction that it is good to be alive, that work can be fun, and that no matter what the setbacks, one must never lose one's self of, sense of humor. And when I read the, uh, the making work fun, I thought of Belinda. Belinda has, she's not here today. She had, she had to be in a meeting, but when... Um, <laughs> When she has positivity, I believe, in her top five strengths. And many times at work, when it's quiet, or maybe all the students are out because you have a break or something like that, and we're, we're at work, um, she'll do something to liven things up, to make work a little funner than it, more fun. I don't know, can you say funner? Anyway, <laughs> more fun than it might be. So those are just some of the descriptors. That's not everything. That's not everything that positivity is or everything that positivity means. But just think about that. Do you have that? Do you know people that have that? Um, moving on. Uh, if you don't, you may have some, if you don't have some of those qualities, that's okay. But one thing that it's important, that is important to do is to identify if you do have negative tendencies. You don't have to be positive in every situation. You don't have to be the, the, the person just walks around with a perpetual smile. That's fine. But if you have some of these negative tendencies that we're going to talk about, you may want to pay attention to those and see if there's something that you can change or tweak. Um, the first one, and these come from an article from the Mayo Clinic. Um, and the first one is filtering. 
And this is where you magnify the negative aspects of a situation and kind of forget the positive. Um, I see, the, and I think a lot of people do this. We probably all have done it once or twice. Um, but if you've ever, how many of you have ever given a speech or sang a song in front of a group or played a musical instrument in front of a group? Have any of you ever done any of those things? And you get a lot of compliments, and so everyone's telling you you did great. And then you go home, and you're just thinking about that one thing you did wrong. And you're filtering out that, all that positivity that was given to you. That's a negative tendency that we need to do away with, because it's not, it's not helping us in any way. And it's, it's not giving credit to other people's opinions or, or their validity, you know, their, their compliments, whatever it may be. Also personalizing, which is when something bad occurs, you automatically say, it's my fault. Uh, maybe you had set up a date and they had to can the person had to cancel or uh, you know, set for a later date. And your automatic thought is, they must not like me. I, they must you know, just really not be interested in me. Um, that's what personalizing is. Catastrophizing. Catastrophizing, you automatically anticipate the worst. Um, and so an example of this is uh, if you go through, let's say you go through um, a drive through and you order something and your order's wrong. They gave you the wrong thing. And so your immediate thought is to assume the, re the rest of the day is going to go bad. Or you're driving to school or work in the morning and somebody cuts you off. Or you get stuck behind a, a train or whatever it is. And it ruins the rest of your day. You're turning a little moment into a big catastrophe. So see if, as we go along, see if you have any of those things in your own life. It's easy to point out, oh my gosh, I know a person that's just like that. Because that's easy to do. But mostly I just want to see, do you have these in yourself? Because I can sometimes see myself with these. The last one is polarizing. You see things only as either good or bad. There is no middle ground. An example of this is, let's say at the beginning of the semester, you take a test, and you just do horrible on it. And your thought is, well, there goes my grade. I, you know, that, that's it. I'm going to get a bad grade in this class. That's, that's polarizing. It's like, no. You did bad on one test. How many do you have left? How many assignments do you have left? How much greater can you still, still do? Um, so if you see any of those in your life, just identify them. Be aware if you have them. Because when you're aware, then you can do, you can do something about it. Um, before before I, I move on to some points I want to make, uh, I want us to realize that positivity isn't about being naive about the realities of life or what is actually true. So I don't know if you can, you can read what this says, but it's a bunch of fruit in a bowl. And it says, looks like we're moving, guys. And this, these fruit are asking, are you our new bowl? Now, this illustrates this idea of uh, ignoring what is true or you know, being naive about the realities of life. This is not a good situation, <laughs> okay? Um, an example that I thought of that I have seen in people that might, may be applicable to you or may soon be applicable, hopefully, at some, some point in your life, um, is marriage. Um, there's this fun dating stage. Everything's, everything's, maybe not everything. Our dating stage certainly wasn't smooth sailing, but... Uh, this is my husband up here, sorry. <laughs> but, um, but a lot of times it's very exciting and, oh my gosh, we're engaged, we're getting married, marriage is going to be awesome, it's going to be so great, we're going to, this is just my perfect partner, and we're going to have this perfect marriage. And that's this type of attitude. That's not what positivity is. What positivity is saying is that, yeah, you know what, there are going to be bumps in the road, but it's going to be awesome, and I'm going to have a can-do attitude, and we're going to make it work no matter what comes our way. So I don't want you to ever confuse being positive with ignoring what is really true about life. People die. You know, people get sick and die all the time. But how do we infuse positivity into that without ignoring the fact that somebody is suffering? And that's, that's, that's what we want to learn how to do. Um, I, 
want to tell one more story about uh, before I get to my points, and it's about smooth rocks. Um, this picture right here is a picture of a little creek. We called it a creek when I was growing up. <laughs> it's a creek, a small river, um, <laughs> behind my house. Um, as Hannah said, I'm from a small town in southwestern Utah called Minersville. There's about 800 people there. And my town is surrounded by a lot of mountains and small hills. And um, when I was little, well, first I should say one of my strengths is input. And people, one attribute of people with input is, a, is they may like to collect things. And as a child, I did like to collect things. And one of my favorite things um, was rocks. So living in a small town, being surrounded with hills and sagebrush and mountains, it was a good place for me to collect rocks. And I especially liked, and you can't see it in this picture because a lot of times it is hard to see even if you have the rock in your hand, but I would find rocks that... Um, had little specks of sparkles in them, or a little bit shiny, because I love sparkly and shiny things. And one day, while just being out and about, it could have even been in my backyard, I don't know where it was, but I found a rock just a little smaller than my fist. And <clears throat> it had these little sparkles in it. And I thought, oh my gosh, this would look so pretty if it looked like these other rocks I had that I had bought at like gift shops at like national parks like Zion's or Death Valley. Um, I would always go and I loved to buy the, the smooth, shiny rocks. Well, as a little girl, I was pretty smart. And uh, you can't laugh, you're my husband. Uh, <laughs> and I knew that down to the river, which we would go, or down to the creek, as, like I said, as we called it, um, I noticed that on the banks of the little river and at the bottom of the river, the rocks there were smooth. When we go, sometimes we find a swimming hole and we'd swim there and I knew the rocks were smooth. So I thought, I have got the best idea. I'm gonna take my rock. So I got the rock and I went to the kitchen, got a mug, pretty big mug, filled it with water, set it on my little dresser in my room and put my rock in it <laughs> because I was gonna make it smooth and shiny, like the rocks from the gift shop. And so I waited, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, and then guess what happened? Yes, the rock was wet. Um, that, <laughs> that's all that happened. The rock was just wet. And later I told my mom that, and she, mom that, and she was thought, I wondered what you were doing with that rock in water. She, I, she didn't really understand what I was doing. Um, but the point I want to make with this story is, is there are, there are volumes and volumes of books on positivity, on positive thinking, on positive psychology, and you can get a lot of information from them. And you can learn a lot about those things. But just reading or just thinking about positivity isn't going to do anything for you. It's just going to be stagnant water just like my rock was just sitting in there, that stagnant water. It wasn't going to become smooth ever. It didn't matter if I waited a 1,000 years. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it would dissolve. I don't know, but probably not. The water would probably have evaporated before anything even remotely started happening to that rock just sitting on my dresser. So if you really want to be more positive or to have that attribute of positivity, you can't just think about it. You must act. There must be some action to go along with what you're reading or what you're discovering. And there is a lot of good stuff out there that you can find out. Um, and as I thought about what can I add to this conversation, what can I say, I thought, well, I could just kind of regurgitate you know, information from, from all of these experts that have written these long books on what it means to be positive or what positive thinking is, or how, 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 do we, uh, how do we change our mindset. But really, I thought back on my own life and the experiences I've had. And so I want to offer just a few ideas to you. Before, I just need to preface them with letting you know these are not groundbreaking. You're probably going to see them and groan a little like, oh my gosh, Betsy, this is, this is something I've known forever. But maybe this will be a little reminder um, as we approach midterms and life is getting a little bit harder um, of some simple things that you might be able to do, that I might be able to do 
to infuse a little more positivity into my life. Um, so the first is smile and have a sense of humor. So going back to uh, my story, one of the things, one of the action items that the Strengths Finder suggests for people with the attribute of positivity is to arm yourself with stories or jokes or, or whatever it may be, experiences that you can share with others. And something like that can lighten the mood. It can give someone hope. It can make people laugh when what they really need is to laugh because maybe their life isn't going so great or whatever it may be. And so I began with my little story, even though it was very embarrassing for me, to hopefully maybe give one or two of you a little laugh or a smile. And I think a couple of you did. Um, maybe I need to improve it. But um, So that's, that's one thing. Arm yourself. Do you have life experiences? Do you have stories? Do you have jokes that, that can maybe help a situation? And I did add when appropriate. You know, if somebody's telling you something really serious, you don't want to just make a joke of it. But there are times when it can really help um, lighten the mood, make the situation better. Um, also, take a step back and smile when your tendency might be to become frustrated, to be frustrated. Um, here's a picture of some toothpicks, and I want you to imagine that uh, you, you have a container of these toothpicks, and they drop on the floor and scatter all over. Now, knowing yourself, think to yourself, what would be your immediate reaction? Would you become mad? Would you let out an expletive? Would you, <laughs> what would you do? So think about that. <laughs> this actually happened to me one time. I was just in my apartment. This was several years ago. I was just in my apartment and I was reaching for a cookbook. And I, the container did have a lid, but it dropped to the floor and it scattered the toothpicks, and there was, I mean, it was full. We probably used two out of the whole thing. The toothpicks scattered everywhere. And I could have gotten mad. I could have gotten frustrated. I could have let it ruin my whole afternoon. But instead, and I wasn't thinking of doing this. It wasn't like, okay, stop. You know, take a step back or whatever. But I just laughed because I thought it was so funny that of all of the things that could have dropped, it was this container full of toothpicks that just scattered everywhere. So when you have those type of things, when you're, when you... I think I, I like to use driving as an example because just knowing myself and many other people that I have driven with, it seems to be a, a source of frustration. And um, is it worth it? Is it worth it to get mad over things like, like that? Don't nod your head. It's not worth it. Um, <laughs> take a step back and smile and say, hey, you know what? I'm alive. Life is good. Yeah, maybe I'm a couple minutes late. Maybe that car annoyed me. Maybe I want to yell and do some gestures to uh, that guy in that car. But it's, it's, it's really not worth it. That's not contributing to your overall well-being. And it's certainly not. The guy in the other car doesn't know what you're saying. He doesn't know that he's, he's ticked you off unless you follow through on your negativity. Um, but it, it doesn't do you any good. So that's, my, that's my, my first bit of advice, or my own experience, is just laugh, smile. Find a little bit of humor in the situation. Um, next one. And I think this one is one of the most important that I've learned for myself. And that's to accept that you can't, you can't control others. All you can do is focus on your own positivity. Focus on what you can contribute to a situation. Um, okay, don't laugh. Just, um, this is me. But before, uh, I just need to uh, clarify a couple things. First of all, I hadn't had braces yet, so I do have a huge gap in my teeth. And uh, this was the early 90s, so uh, late 80s, early 90s. So shoulder pads were still big. I wasn't a football player. I just have these, these shoulder pads in my, in my little outfit. Um, but... This was me in around third grade. And when I was in third grade, there were these two girls. Like I said, I'm from a small town, so we would just walk or ride our bikes to school all the time. You knew, I knew everybody. And there was these two girls that were a couple years older than me. And 
I don't remember if I was exactly in third grade, but I was, I was younger. And for some reason, they decided to pretty much start harassing me when I was walking home from school. And they would say things that, for a little girl, were, were quite hurtful. They would call me names that I never heard in my own household. They were not, not words that I was accustomed to hearing. And um, uh, to call me, th say things like, you know, goody two-shoes, you think you're so good. And I'm like, I'm in third grade, what? Where is this coming from? Um, <laughs> I did have, I was, I, I, I was dating, I did like the cousin of one of the people, so I thought maybe they didn't like me because I liked the cousin and he liked me back, you know, little elementary school drama, maybe that was it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I honestly didn't know why, why they would, they would bug me, and they, they would walk behind me and say those things, and I would just walk and you know, try to ignore them. And I, I couldn't understand why they, why they would say that, but I knew I couldn't control them. They were bigger and older and meaner, and I wouldn't want to mess with them. Uh, but I also knew that I didn't want to be at their mercy, um, the mercy of them, and let them control how I felt, except for the one time that me and a friend hid behind a car and said some smart alecky response to them and, like, laughed about it like we were so sneaky. But that, that, didn't, really, that didn't really help the situation. But it did make me feel good that one time. Um, so through the years after this experience, as I grew up and I, I would walk down my road, they both lived on my road or very near my road. Um, whenever I saw them, I'd just smile and say, hi. I wasn't going to stop and be their best friend and be like, hey, how's it going? But um, I would just smile and say, hi, or hello. And I would keep on walking. And that's all I did. And it didn't make us best friends. I didn't, I, in fact, I don't know what's happened of their lives. They, they probably haven't been the greatest from what I, little I do know. But for me, I wasn't holding on to that negativity. I forgave them. And that forgiveness released me from that negativity. I wasn't at their mercy because I controlled myself. They gave me negativity and I gave them back my own positivity. And I've had many experiences in my life. As I went through teenage years, I remember a friend telling me that another person had said something very hurtful about me. And I thought, well, first of all, you're my friend. Why would you tell me that they said that? Just keep it to yourself. Um, but I think all of us have had those, those, those feelings, um, those moments when somebody in our life said something negative about us, tore us down, tried to make us feel that we were not capable of doing something. And it's up to us if we accept that negativity or we try and control them and change the way they are, or if we just simply say, I don't need to accept that and I'm gonna put out my own positivity into the world. I'm gonna react to this in a different way than what was given to me. And that's a, a very strong, strong lesson that I have learned. So accepting that you can't control others, instead, put out your own positivity. Um, using positive language. Uh, this, is, this is a big one. In the, the book that uh, first semester students use in the, in the program, in the leadership course, uh, this is one of the sections when it's talking about using positive language when you're around others. This is essential as a leader because you're the one in charge. And if you're sending out negative messages all the time, we're not doing good enough. We need to do better. Uh, I've talked with people and that's how their, their boss or their supervisor makes them feel. That's, that's not helpful. Nobody wants to work in that environment. Um, so here are a couple of specific types of language that I think myself and probably some of you could work on as well. Um, avoid, sorry, this is kind of small if you can't see it. Avoid excessive or hurtful sarcasm. Now, some people excel <laughs> at sarcasm, and it can be really funny. And a, a perfectly timed sarcastic remark can sometimes be the thing to lighten the mood. But when it's excessive or hurtful, it doesn't, it's not bringing anybody up. It usually tears down. It's usually hurting somebody's feelings. 
sarcasm has its place, but if you find yourself constantly, you know, giving those sarcastic looks or, or responses, it's, it's possible that somebody is being hurt. So change it up a little bit. Don't be sarcastic all the time. Um, try and say something maybe positive. And I know that for myself, that's something that I could work on. Um, also, don't complain all the time. I put in all the time because all of us need someone or you know, a friend, a parent, a spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, somebody who we can just kind of unload on sometimes <laughs> to share our burdens, to maybe complain a little bit, and I think that's okay. Um, but again, we may all have someone in mind that that's, the, that's that person that's always complaining and always um, saying that something's wrong or some, this person did this or this happened to me. And it just drags you down. One, you don't want to be around people like that. Two, don't be that person because nobody then will want to be around you. Um, it doesn't create a good envi environment. So if your language, if you have a, a complaint, um, follow it up with something positive. Like, this isn't working, but let, let's try this. Uh, that's a better way to do it. And then last of all, use encouraging, uplifting lang language. And I have a picture up here of a friend that I visited. This is in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. My friend Denise was living in uh, Washington, D.C. with her husband while he was uh, going to medical school. And that's why that picture's up there. But I'm going to go back even further. She was my roommate in college. Um, and she was a really good friend. And I had a couple other roommates who were also really good friends. We became, they became my best friends, and I still um, have contact with them. Well, um, after my junior year, as was mentioned, I decided to serve an LDS mission. Came back. By that point, all my friends had graduated, moved on, married, were not around. And it was very difficult for me um, because I didn't have that circle of friends. And I especially needed that circle of friends because I thought I was going to marry this guy who, turns out, was thinking of marrying not me. Some, another girl, in fact. <laughs> so I spent uh, days, and days turned into months of uh, crying on and off and pretty much feeling horrible about life because I didn't have my best friends with me. I didn't have people even on campus that I knew really well because everyone would, it seemed like everyone had just moved on except for uh, here and there. Um, my family was very supportive, but they were six and a half, eight hours away. So, you know, they could, my mom like sent me flowers and chocolate. You know, she was, she was very kind, but I didn't have, you know, anybody really there living with me to hold my hand and tell me it would be okay. But Denise, she had gotten married, and she still lived in Rexburg, which is where I was going to school at the time. And she had her own life. She was expecting a child, and um, she was teaching a Spanish class uh, as an adjunct in instructor at the university. And one day she, she came, and she gave me, she had done a bunch of research and looked up a bunch of things, and she gave me this really, really nice letter that it contained some inspiring quotes and messages and speeches that I, I could look at to remind me that life was going to be OK when I was pretty much experiencing the hardest time of my life. It was over a boy, but I mean, still, it, it, was, it, it, meant, it meant something at the time. And so that encouraging, uplifting language that she shared with me made the difference. It helped me to realize life's, life's going to get better. And it did. And I remained friends with that guy, we'll call him. Uh, I won't mention his name. Um, but uh, I remember even like helping him with his college algebra or something, even while he was engaged to another girl. You know, I, I got over it. Again, going back to the previous, the previous thought of not allowing the negativity con to control me, but putting positivity out there. My friend Denise did that for me, and then I was able to do that towards this guy. Um, so this is a very important one. As you go day to day, watch your language. What type of language are you using? 
Is it hurtful? Is it tearing down? Is it putting negativity out there? Or is it uplifting? Does it make someone feel better? Does it make them want to have a better day or a bad day or wish they had never you know, left their bedroom? Because you, you have that influence. Many of you interact with each other a whole lot. And if you're tearing someone down that you're around a lot, it's creating a really bad situation for that person. So be aware of the type of language that you're using and use positive language. Um, the next one is live a healthy life. Uh, I think most of us, some more than others, are familiar with this word hangry. And it says, a state of anger caused by lack of food, hunger causing a negative change in emotional state. How many of you experience this? This is a real thing. You should be raising your hand. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, but I bring this up because, again, this is not going to be groundbreaking. This is what I've experienced in my own life. If you're not taking care of yourself and living a healthy life, you don't feel good about yourself, and you're certainly not going to be have, have the energy to be positive and help others. So, first of all, eat. Eat. <laughs> Sleep. These are basic things in life. Eat, sleep, exercise, meditate. These are the basics. They are simple. But if you're not following through on them, again, you do not have the capacity to put positivity out there because you can't even, you're, you can't even take care of yourself. You're, you're living on that edge of, oh, I just, I just need some sleep, or, oh, I'm just so hungry that I'm hangry. Um, exercise, I like this one. Um, studies have shown, even with a, a group of, of uh, I think it was 12 people, they did a study with 12 people, and had them go just on a 25-minute walk in a green space, so like in a park or on a hike. And it had the ability to heighten the mood and energize and give that positivity into their life more than, uh, than, than many other things. For example, walking on a busy street or uh, whatever it is. So green space, taking advantage of nature um, when you exercise, even if it's just going for a walk, can really have that positive influence on you. Um, in, in talking about these things, um, I do want to recognize that there will be times in your life or in maybe someone else's life that you know that they experience real depression. Um, you know, clinical depression, they've been diagnosed with it. And simply doing some of these things we talked about, like eating and sleeping or just, oh, you know, think positively or use positive language doesn't always help. So be aware that there are people who, and maybe it's yourself, and I don't want to make light of that and just say, oh, if you do these things, you're not going to be depressed anymore. You know, you're not going to feel negative about life because that doesn't always happen. You may need additional resources. And if that's the case, I encourage you to seek out those additional resources. I just wanted to, to put that in there. But if you're just having a difficult time in school or it's just kind of you're having a down period, examine some of these things. Are you getting the proper nutrition? Are you sleeping or are you staying up till two and then getting up at seven or six or whatever? You know, are, are these things happening? Do you take time to exercise? It can really lighten your mood and inject positivity into your life, as well as meditation. A lot of times you can exercise and meditate at the same time. Um, it allows your mind to wander and, again, bring those positive vibes, I guess, uh, into your life. This is the last one. And um, it's living true to your values. And again, if any of the students in my class will know that this is the first thing that we talk about in our leadership course, is knowing what your values are and then living them. And how essential that is to a leader, not only a leader, but to your positivity. Could I, and then I have this quote from um, Brooke Broadbent from uh, an, an article online. And if I could have somebody that may be on the front row that can read. Heather, can you see? Okay. You've seen them, people who smile from ear to ear and seem to exude inner peace. 
Do you know how they got that oh-so-good feeling? Chances are that they figured out what was really important to them and began living true to those values. How would, you, how would your life change if you began to live more in line with the values you believe in? How would you improve your health, your relationships, and your quality of life? What would you begin to say no to? Doubt? Fear? Addiction? What would you begin to say yes to? Self-confidence? Love? Empowerment? Okay, so that's what I mean by living true to your values. What, what is it that you live for? What is it that you stand for? Do you stand for fear? Do you stand for doubt? No, but if those things are overtaking your life, then, then you're not living true to who you are. I like how it says, what would you begin to say no to? There's probably a lot of things that we might say no to if we were to live true to ourselves. How many of us, I mean, how many people is it important for, for them to be super, super busy and running from one thing to another? Some people that is, that's how they find um, meaning they feel like they're, they're giving back to the world when they're super busy. But most of us, that just runs us ragged. Then why do we do it? That's not staying true to ourselves. That's not staying true to our values. And along with saying no, saying yes, allowing things into our life that may cause us to change our life or maybe make us a little uncomfortable at first because they require extra effort, um, like love. Love can, love can take a lot out of us sometimes. But if we're living true to those things, it allows us to be positive. When we're not, we, we, you just feel down. You feel like you've just been wrung out, like, like a wet rag, and you really have nothing left to give. And like the, this, this previous one, living a healthy life, when you're not taking care of those basic things, it's very hard for you then to send that positivity out to others. Um, so those, those five things are just... a a few simple, you know, things every day that, that we can, that I can work on and that maybe you can work on to help yourself develop that strength of positivity if you don't have it, or if you do have it, to increase it, to actually use it. Um, and there, I asked a, a couple of students who have positivity as their strengths to share examples, um, specific examples from their own life of how they have used their positivity um, in, in their life. And so first I've asked Devin Parasso, and he's going to come and share with us his example. Do I act professional? Okay. <clears throat> okay. No. Okay. Well, guys, um, she, I don't know why she asked me. Uh, I don't think she could find anybody else, to be honest. But, um, yeah, she might have known my nickname, DP, you know, stands for Devin Parasso or Dr. Positive, either one. <laughs> <But> <laughs> either way, either way works. <laughs> um, use as you will. But um, just a few examples how positivity has kind of influenced my life. Um, I, I don't know if this is something somebody's born with or you develop it. I certainly think this is something, a skill I developed over the years. Um, when I first saw it manifest itself in my life, is kind of a tragic story, but a good one, um, <laughs> if you can believe that. But my parents were divorced, and then it was like, oh, no, what's happening with my life? And I was like, wait, I choose to be happy. And from that point forth, it was just kind of like, oh, it's, it's like a snowball effect that I've seen in my life. Um, another thing, which a lot of us can relate to, is in dating. Um, you know, you ask a girl out and she tells you no. You're like, oh. <sighs> you know, you're sad. Not that that happens often, but. <laughs> but um, just the mind frame of, you know, I'm thinking, she just doesn't know how great I am yet. Because let's be honest, <laughs> I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's actually, that's actually helped a little bit, not much. Um, but what I've seen it mostly is just how it affects other people. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm in the zone. I'm one of the zone managers. And it's actually really neat to be loud and happy all the time because you see how it affects other people. I'm always like, hey, free pancakes, free waffles. And everybody's like, no way. I'm like, yeah. And then you just see them smile afterwards. And it's just kind of, it's just neat to see this, how positivity really affects other people, you know. 
just being able to smile even though, you know, somebody else is having a hard day, that smile can just change their day for a minute, and it's awesome. So yeah, that, that's, those are some experiences I've had with positivity, and it's only my third strength, so you guys can imagine what my top two are like, right? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, is Liz here? Liz Wolf. Oh, Liz, if you want to come up. So, unlike Devin, I made notes. So, so I, uh, no, that was, that, I am nervous to be in front of you guys. Very, very nervous. So I had to make notes so I wouldn't keep my train of thought. Um, so... I am happy because this is a choice that I make. I choose to be happy, um, and I smile because it's what keeps me stuck together. I am a full-time mom, a full-time wife, a full-time student. Um, this semester, I'm taking 17 credits, and two of my classes require me to also do an additional 30 hours of service learning. I have four kids, um, very active kids. We're involved in after school clubs, we're involved in sports, we're involved in dance. My husband works full time and is taking seven credits this semester. We're kind of busy a little bit in our lives. She mentioned people who are over busy, over busy. Um, but, it's what I, but it's what I choose. I choose to be over busy and it, and it works for me. If I focus on all the things that aren't being done, then nothing is gonna be done. So I focus on choosing that battle. If any of you are parents, maybe I'm the only one old enough, but. When you're a parent, you know that phrase, choose your battles, but that applies to more than just raising kids. So I've chosen to choose the battles that really matter to me rather than waiting for them to get to me. I choose first. Um, so I wish that I had gotten college done before I had kids. I wish that my husband made more money. I wish that I had always been a stay-at-home mom, could always be a stay-at-home mom. But that's not what I choose. This is a life that I choose. I chose to have a husband who's diabetic. I chose to have four kids when I was really young. I chose to be in my 30s and go back to college. I choose not to care about what my house looks like, ever. <laughs> uh, really. Uh, I choose to not worry about the fact that I don't have the best body, because that's what I choose. I choose to remind my kids to do hard things, and I choose to do hard things myself. But there's things that are also out of my control. So do I get angry that I have some kids with special needs? Do I get sad that the sole breadwinner doesn't really win the bread? Am I, am I jaded that my parents got divorced when I was a teenager? Or do I choose to be positive? I think back to what Betsy said towards the beginning of her um, talk, she had like a list of bullet points up there, and one of them was to be on the lookout for the positive in the situation, and I always am. I choose to find the good things, so this is what the life that I chose. This is how I chose to be, so why would I choose to do it with a frown, and I'm not going to sing for you, but start singing in your own head, if you chance to meet a frown, there you go. Thank you so much, Liz. That was awesome. We probably could have just listened to that and gone home. Well, first had the little, the little food back there to take care of ourselves, but, and that as well. Um, the last person, I roped my husband into this because he, he, I also had him take the strengths finder and he had positivity. So I asked him if he would share an experience and hopefully it's a good one or it doesn't embarrass me. Oh, it'll be embarrassing. All right. So yeah, I'm Jonathan. I'm Betsy's husband. And uh, it's funny she mentioned her... Uh, well, by the way, so the guy that like broke her heart and she's crying over, that was definitely not me. <laughs> so uh, that's a good thing. It's funny she mentioned him though, because my story is kind of about an ex-girlfriend. So uh, this will be this will be good. All right, <laughs> payback. When I was uh, a certain age, a few years ago, um, I met this girl and she was really really cool. And I was like, this is a cool girl. So I used to go over to her house, and I had to ask my parents if I could go over to her house. So I was like, hey, can I go over to your house? And she said, they said yes. And uh, anyways, after going to her house a few times, I remember walking in the door, and she, she was like, hey, come to the back. So we went to the backyard, and there was this big box. It was a cardboard box. And I was like, OK, this is a little weird. And she turned to me and whispered, do you want to make babies with me? Now, as a five-year-old, that's okay. 
and I, I was pretty, uh, pretty okay with it. I said, yeah, I want to be a dad. That's cool. And uh, fortunately, uh, we thought that a special hug was actually hugging, so we just ended up hugging for a while and uh, went back to throwing rocks at fences and stuff. But uh, anyways, so I always, I always wanted to be a dad. That was like my biggest dream. And uh, as you can see, I'm really happy that that's happening. Um, but our story wasn't always great. His name's not Jenser, actually. Thank you. Thank goodness. Um, anyway, so... So back f probably three, two years ago, when we got married, we were super happy. And we had both like talked about having kids before. We were super stoked to have kids, so we always dreamed of. And uh, anyways, I had testicular cancer as a kid and figured, oh, you know, whatever. The doctors have always said, like, you're cool, you're going to have kids, no worries, don't worry about it. Um, anyway, so after a year of trying, I remember sitting in this doctor's office and waiting for my test results, and they gave me the sheet back and just said, uh, so the doctor's not really around, so... Uh, if you need to talk to someone, just call a specialist. I thought that was a little weird. So I left out, left out of the hospital room and went to the, in my car. And I, I understood it because it had a big zero for my sperm count. And that was really a hard thing for me. And we had more tests happen and just the same thing happened. And I found out I was infertile. I, I couldn't have kids. And as someone who had always dreamed of having a kid, uh, in that moment, it was kind of hard for me to be positive and just say, oh, yeah, like, I'm not down, like, down on myself. I'm super happy. But that's not what posit positivity is to me. Positivity, to me, is hoping for things that are sure to come. So keeping a positive, futuristic outlook on things. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're always happy or that you're always nice all the time or that you never get down. But for me, it really means that if you focus on the things in life that you can change, that you can do, that you should expect good things to come. You should expect those things to come if you, if you can control those things uh, in your life. Uh, I found out I was infertile. I could have controlled myself and been depressed for a few months or for years or been upset with life or with God or anybody. Uh, but instead, I decided to focus on things I could control. I went and searched out every way that I could like potentially raise children with Betsy still and uh, looked at in vitro. I chose to work full time. I worked 40 hours for a year and a half to be able to pay for in vitro and I'm still paying it back. But it's something I, cho I, I choose, just like Liz was saying. And uh, anyways, so I, as, as I hope you notice, things are working out great for us. And it doesn't always work out like that in life, but I am so happy that it did. And I, and I really can say that it was because of a positive attitude through those, through those hard times that brought me to such a happiness now. And uh, anyways, I'm positive, pun intended, that each of you will find a great deal of success by staying positive about your future and by taking charge of the things you can control. Thank you. Thank you. Devin and Liz and Jonathan for sharing your experiences. Um, to, to end, I just want to pretty much echo, they, they pretty much said what I was going to say at the end, is that each of, each of the things that you do in your life are your choice. It is your choice, the type of language you use around people. It is your choice, what you allow to come into your life and what you put back out. All of those things depend on you. And what this world does need, I know, is a, is a lot of positivity. Those people who can make you smile. Those people like Maddie who you want to be around. Those people like Jules who you know, are always compliment, complimenting and giving praise. And life isn't perfect. Like I said, there, there are down times, times like that I had when I was crying, but they don't have to stay forever. And you can be the influence on yourself to overcome those things, and you can also be the influence on others to help them overcome those difficult times. So focus on your positivity as you enter into midterms and finals and whatever else that life may bring you in this upcoming year. Thanks. Okay, we just like to thank Betsy so much. She did an amazing job. So we have this gift for her as well. You. You're welcome. Okay, um, <clears throat> we do have a couple of announcements just before we let you all go. Um, so a couple of things. Next week, 
or yeah, next week, next Tuesday, the 13th. Um, is breakfast for lunch in the Cal office. Um, it's from 11 to 1, so come in any time. We're going to have a lot of good food. It's going to be great. And um, that's welcome to all students that want to come in there. Um, another quick thing, um, we the survey's open um, for us to be ranked um, in the Leadership 500 Awards, like we were last year. Um, so obviously, we want to be there again. So to take that survey, um, please make sure to do that as soon as you can. And it closes on August 15th. So please be sure to do that um, before then. Um, and then the last one I have, um, before I pass it on to some others, um, if you are going to be leaving the housing program for the spring, um, please make sure that you just fill out the housing exit form by November 1st so the other students can have that option. I'm going to have Jules and then Spencer do a couple of announcements, too. So she meant October 15th. But you have to, you said August. It's all good. Say, it's a survey that you take. Breakfast for lunch is in the Cal office in the conference room. Anyway, say really good things about us. Okay, um, how many of you know what a FAFSA is? How many of you have actually done a FAFSA this year? Cool. Um, how many of you know what work study is? There is a work study position in the Cal office, and we would very, very much like, if you haven't done your FAFSA and you would love to work in the Cal office, do your FAFSA like today and uh, go into the financial aid office and have them approve your work study. Anyway, we would love to work with you. It's, um, it's going to be the new Josh. So we would love to have you. Um, if you have any questions, you can talk to me after. Thanks so much. It's part time. What's up, guys? Um, so really quick here, um, we are um, being part of the haunted house um, for student alumni here. Um, and so that is um, the 28th, 29th, and 30th. On the night of the 30th, um, the, the Wolverine Ambassadors and also um, Cal, we are sponsoring a night on that 30th. And so we're looking for about 15 to 20 volunteers who are wanting to help with um, registration, um, running a booth. Um, if you do a volunteer, you get free admission um, to uh, the haunted house to the previous night, um, and you will get dinner the night as well. So if you are interested, go ahead and um, let me know afterwards. Um, and uh, that's it. Thanks for coming. There's food back here, and uh, have a good night. <laughs>